Um, raise your hand if you use chatbots like ChatGPT and all that for your work. That's a lot. Now, raise your hand if you have a business license to use it. Like, you actually pay for it. This is interesting because if I, you know, when I asked the same question half a year ago, hardly anyone would raise their hands. It's typically the free version that people use, which is, you know, not at the same standard. But, you know, this has become sort of much more ingrained in many aspects of society than we like to think. Now, you know, even over a decade ago, you know, Nick Carr asked this question, is the Internet making us stupid? And the main point, main thrust of his thinking was that the Internet is rewiring our brain for shallow thinking. Why is that? Because, you know, if you want to understand something, you go and you Google it, right? And you get snippets of information. You kind of compile the snippets of information into something. And he sort of compared it to saying, you know, you see the leaves and you see the trunks of a tree, but you don't see the forest anymore. You don't actually take the time and go into depth and contemplation to learn something, which is true when you grew up in the world like I did grow up in, which is you go to libraries, right? You read from books, you don't have the internet. And so for people of a certain generation, and I guess he's a little bit older than I am, you know, we grew up in a world where we couldn't imagine that you talk to a chatbot to find something out, right? Or you search the internet to find something out because I didn't grow up with the internet, right? So our perception is always, well, you know, it's doing something to our brains which ultimately may harm us. Now, is it entirely wrong? Has society become more stupid since the advent of the internet? It's an interesting question. I don't know, right? I mean, it sometimes feels like it, right? But is it the fault of the internet? Uh, I don't know. It clearly has done something, which is it has democratized the access to information. You know, I spent, before I moved to Germany, about eight years in, in Kenya, for example, and several years in India. And when I look at the democratization of access to technology, it's crazy, right? I mean, it has fundamentally changed the barriers to entry for anyone in the world to access something. So... Maybe I can trade it off a little bit by saying, yes, you know, our cognitive processes are changing, but is it necessarily a bad thing? Now, with, with AI, I will make the case that it's getting a little bit more complicated in this. But let me step back a little bit and talk to you about, you know, what are, for example, today's, right? You know, I work at a university, right? And, um, you know, we care a lot about training people for, you know, the world, right? Training people to make a contribution to companies and society in general. And what you see is if you have sort of a basic apprenticeship and learning um, or education, then you typically fall into this category, right? So your cost to the employer is fairly low, right? Low enough. But what employers often really want, right, what if you have a company, what you really want is the people who kind of hit the ball out of the park or whatever analogy you want to use, which is, you know, they're very skilled or they're even experts in something. And it takes years to develop deep expertise, right? You know that all from yourself. It takes years to get really good at something, right? And when we look about... On the other hand, what does it actually mean to get there? And this is how a typical chart, by the way, how universities, you know, just everyone who went to a university, I can assure you that in the background, a lot of folks, including myself, we think along the lines of a study program from these dimensions. What our job is, what we think mastery means that there are certain cognitive processes like, you know, how well can you remember something all the way to how good are you in creating something, both from the knowledge dimension, which means 
you know, what kind of facts can you remember? How well can you reflect about what you've actually learned? And how well are you able to take concepts and create something new, right? And when you are a bachelor student, then, you know, maybe we don't focus so much on on the evaluation creation part. When you are a master's student, we probably focus more on the latter part of the cognitive processes because we make an assumption that you already know. But the reality is, you know, when you go to school today, you know, what we do a lot is we test you here, right? We test, can you memorize, right? I mean, the reality is, again, if you go to a university today and you want to do your bachelor's, you'll get by you'll get quite far by just being really good here, right? Because our assessment systems are set up in exactly this way. Now, I have been working in, you know, large corporates and startups and scale-ups for the last 25 years. And I can assure you of one thing. You can take my word for this. If you're really good here in the evaluation and creation part, you will set yourself apart. People who have careers in any type of companies or universities or whatever are really good in kind of assessing the world around them and coming up with new solutions. Remember what I just said before, this is not necessarily exactly what we train you for, right? We try to hone these skills to hope that you can actually excel in these, right? And then the employer will do their own part. So what exactly is AI doing? So what AI is promising, right? And this is really interesting. So this is a chart that you see in some of the, the, the studies and all that. And what it says basically is the following. If you are an early employee and you use AI, for example, as a beginner, you can work at the level of a skilled employee. If you are sort of average, you know your stuff, but you're still not deep enough, you could become an expert by working with AI. And there are studies that in some areas show that this is actually possible. Think about this, just what it implies, right? What it implies means from an employer perspective, and you know, as I was just introduced, you know, I also you know, uh, run together with a friend of mine, a startup, and you know, Startups typically get employees here, right? And, and the reason is not necessarily because people don't like us. The reason is we can't afford them if they are here, right? I mean, they're too expensive. So, so we take, you know, whatever we can pay for. And now I'm saying, I give you 20 bucks a month, buy yourself a business license to some chatbot, and guess what? I all of a sudden got a really skilled employee, you know, for $20 a month and the salary that I can afford, right? You can see from my excitement, right? As an employer, I'm totally psyched about this, right? I mean, this is really cool, if it's true. And, I mean, the first indications, and I experiment a lot with these kinds of things, it is actually true. But, but, but ask yourself, what does it really mean, right? How does it work that I could be a beginner and become skilled with the help of AI? So let me show you a self-experiment, right? So usually everything I tell you, I do myself. I spend more time, way more time, like my time on Google these days is maybe 5% compared to the time that I use AI to do my work, whether it's in school, at university, whether it's in my company, whether it's working with my 14-year-old kid and helping him with his homework or everything I do with AI today. Like I'm deeply convinced that this is the tool that I want to use. Not so much because I think that's what the future is going to look like, but if we don't try it, you'll never know, right? So I'm not an expert. My expertise is in, you know, in something in computer science, but it's not artificial intelligence, right? I probably know more about it than the average. So I would say I'm probably in this space. So what I just claimed is that I can use AI to actually become skilled. So how does that work? So I've been running a self-experiment literally on myself for the last you know, two weeks. 
And here's how I started. So what I did is, you know, I found a tweet, right? I, you know, use Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. And um, so I found a tweet where, you know, a god of AI said, if you read these 30 papers, these are scientific publications, very, very complex and deep and mathematical. If you read these 30 papers, then you will know everything you need to know about large language models. So the technology behind ChatGPT and Google's Gemini and all that, right? So I said, that's great because I want to be an expert in large language models. How do I do this? So I took these 30 papers because I don't have time to read 30 papers, trust me, right? I mean, that takes me a year to read 30 papers at the level of depth that I can. But, you know, remember what I told you before is that AI is promising me to become from a beginner to a skilled guy um, by using AI. So I did an interesting thing, which is I took all these 30 papers, or here's just a sample of it, and I put them into a chatbot. And I asked the chatbot, read all of these papers and show me what are the most interesting and most novel concepts that I need to know to become an expert in large language models. Okay, so I took all these papers and I put them in one by one and I then created sort of a map of all of these concepts. And you don't have to worry about, unless you're an expert, what all of these things mean. I don't know yet, right? Because I've only been doing this for two weeks. So, but, <laughs> but there's an interesting aspect to this, which is, so there are a couple of interesting findings here. So what I can do next now, and this is really fascinating, right? I can look at two of these concepts and I can ask the chatbot and say, what is the meaning of sequence transduction? You know, these are two words in this combination that I've heard for the first time in my life, okay? And it explains it to me in a way that I can understand, right? I find it useful. And then I say, oh, you know, what is an attention function, which I kind of knew. And then I can also ask, well, how are these concepts related to each other? Why did you draw me a line? Because I didn't draw any of this stuff, right? I just asked my chatbot to produce all of these information. So I can ask it, what are these lines? Why are they connected? And I can go at whatever level of depth I want to go to. And my hope is that I can become, you know, really skilled in what these large language models, how they work, how this technology is, etc., etc. So it's a new way of learning together with this entity, let me call it this way, and um, and I find it, I, I I find it very interesting because it does amplify my sort of cognitive abilities. I can't read 30 papers. I don't have the time. I don't even have the the math skills to understand some of those. Right. So. I'm using AI to help me go through this. But here's another interesting thing. So here's somebody, you know, a very famous AI researcher who says, you know, you have to read these 30 papers, then you will understand. And so then I asked the AI, well, you know, bring all these concepts together. And here, if you notice this, here's something really interesting. This is what I want to learn. These are the two things that are connected to this and then there is a whole bunch of other stuff that has actually no connection to what I want to learn and if this reminds you of your university education or whatever education you have you're absolutely right right we as experts we give you a whole bunch of stuff and say this is so incredibly important for you to actually understand but we never talk about, is there really a connection between these things? If you want to be focused in learning something, right? are there actually the connections? So I learned something from the AI, which is, if you just focus on this, you'll actually get to what you need. All of this is nice to know, and when you have more time than you have, then go into any of these do domains to learn more about it but right now I can be absolutely cool and say I'm going to learn these three things and I'm going to become skilled and next time when I speak to you next year I'll let you know how it went but here here's here's the thing that kind of blows me away right that we need to think really deeply about remember these cognitive process dimensions 
think about it, at universities, at educational institutions, we want you over many years to become proficient in this area in the hope that you can at some point differentiate yourself in your abilities to create new things because our society needs us to create new things. It doesn't need us to remember things really well. Nobody needs the, nobody loves the guy who remembers things, right? We love the guy who comes up with new, or girl for that matter, who comes up with new stuff. We want more guys and girls to come up with new stuff. We don't want more Wikipedias, right? So, so what you now have to think about, and here's the interesting thing, from my, ex, from my analysis in the cognitive processes, this is the area where AI is reasonably good at. It clearly can memorize better than any of us. It has an impeccable way of understanding things in a way that we don't, right? Try it out, take a really complex thing and ask the AI, explain to me as if I'm five. And you will get an explanation that's amazing, that will actually tell you something that you didn't know before, right? It will help you. I use it for coding tasks all the time. I tell my engineers to use it for coding times because it can actually apply a lot of things much better than I do. It can analyze my code or my writing and give me feedback on things and to some extent also evaluate and position it towards other things. One of the things that my AI has never helped me with, not a single time in the last year that I've been working with it closely, is it never helped me to be an innovator. It never helped me to create something new. It only helped me to understand all of this much better and be much faster at this. When it comes to inventing something new, it's all me. And it's going to be all you, right? But I can save myself, and that's my hypothesis. I can save myself, you know, three years of stuff because maybe I don't need that much. Right? Maybe I don't have to study for three years. Maybe I can, if I want to create something new, rely on AI or work with AI in a way that makes this faster. That's the hypothesis. Will it be true? I don't know. May or may not be. I'm not a futurist. I'm just a regular guy who tries this out on a daily basis. So take it in that vein. So here's what I want to leave you with and then open it up for discussion. Right. Um, the first question for me is, always remember, whatever you do as a job, you will differentiate yourself in a way how you can evaluate and create better. So the question to me is, can we utilize AI in such a way that we can spend more time on creation, that we can spend more time on doing something new, right? And, and really use the machines effectively. The one thing, and this is the same problem with, you know, in the university system today, on the educational system at large today, everyone will tell you that the creative process is important, that critical thinking is important, and nobody tells you how that actually works. In the same way, a lot of people are telling you today that AI is going to do all of these things, but have you ever been taught how to actually use it, right? I mean, at the university where I work at IU International, right, that's exactly the thrust that we are taking. We don't think that people will learn how to use these machines by themselves, right? We truly believe that you actually have to teach people how to use these machines, right? Um, the second thing is that as educational institutions, and this is a big thing, I think the future of bachelor's studies should not be three years. I don't think in the future we will need three years to study for a bachelor's. I think we can do it in less time. We need to rethink the way how we actually do it, right? I mean, we need to rethink in the way how we teach and how we can learn together. So I call this the theoretical minimum, right? So what is the theoretical minimum for any subject area that we should be learning and where we can use AI to actually learn it more efficiently? And the third point is, of course, are we running a risk of trading off mastery with efficiency? What I mean with this in very concrete terms, one of the things that we have noticed at IU is that 80% um, of our students are now submitting work 
which was written with ChatGPT. Now it's not just at IU. I hear the same complaint from you know my friends in the United States and friends in Canada. In any university system today, ChatGPT is sort of your student in the back, right? Everyone is writing their stuff, and the results are atrocious. They are terrible because nobody actually taught people how to really write an essay with ChatGPT or Claude or whoever, right? So we need to be careful about this. So in the same way as I think it is an important discussion whether the internet has made us stupid or Google has made us stupid, I think we need to really be careful. So the question is not necessarily only am I going to get more efficient, right? The question that we as a society and as individuals and educational institutions need to really answer is that can we learn deeper with machines than ever before? Can we learn at a level that will enable us to create new things better, faster, and with, with sort of higher impact than before? Because if not, AI will actually do make us stupid and it will be detrimental for society. If yes, I think the benefit to society can be tremendous. And that's all I had to say. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'll open it up for questions. Test, test. Okay, works. Um, just one question. You say that we have more time for creation if we need less time for knowledge acquisition and so on. But don't you think that the process of acquiring knowledge, that is actually reading these 30 papers, helps you becoming a better creator by learning to differentiate between important and unimportant stuff and so on. And if we skip these parts altogether, we may indeed become dumber or better, no, worse creators, because we don't know how to think, differentiate, and acquire knowledge. Uh, that, that's, a, that's an amazing question. Um, no, I, uh, I, I think you, you, you're absolutely right. I'm not, but I never said that we should skip the part, right? So I never said that, you know, we should, we should not think of this as important. We should just think of it as something that AI is really good at if we work together with it in this phase. That doesn't mean that you type in, you know, something and the AI will take care of all of that. And then you sit there, You're absolutely right, right? I mean, you know, I've been sort of an inventor, an innovator for 25 years. I wasn't an inventor on day one. It's, some, it's a skill that you learn over time, and it takes a lot. The only thing is that I believe that, you know, today we have an additional resource to help us with things that we never had before. That doesn't make this less relevant. It's just a tool that makes this the acquisition of this to get here easier. But it's a really important point. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you. That was really great to hear all of this. So I have a good that you're showing this because I have a question up on this slide. You have remember, understand, apply, and then in the end of it you have create. Uh, I would say that understand is a bit of a big s statement at this point. If we think about AI, it might be explain more than less. And I would bring the understand next to create, just to make the distinction how AI works. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting that you are asking this question because um, uh, I've been asking myself this as well. But This is actually a, um, a framework that educators use. So I didn't. So the idea of this framework is that, you know, in the, you know, we as educational institutions, we should assess the cognitive processes against the the the, the knowledge dimensions, from sort of lower level cognitive processes to the high level cognitive processes, right? So. 
I didn't make up this categorization. This is specifically, you know, from Bloom's taxonomy to uh, Anderson Krautwold's taxonomy. So these are things that are fairly well understood. Now, the question, of course, that I would ask is, understanding also means uh, in human terms that we have a world model of and we can play certain things in that world model. The AIs don't have a world model, right? AIs are sort of sentence predictors that are brute force trained by all the information available in textual form, right? Um, so understand in the AI sense is not understand in the human sense. But the AI is not a human either. The AI is not mimicking humans either. The AI is, in my mind, a beautiful machine that can do amazing things, but it has nothing to do with, with the human mind or the human brain, at least as far as I can tell. Who knows, right? But at this point in time, I'm not confused about it because I don't confuse the understanding. It can mimic understanding in a way that we can... That, that it matches ours, but the reasoning behind why it understands the way it understands to me is completely different. So yes, thank you very much. Any other question before we have to? Yes, thank you so much. I am an academic myself, so I understand the presentation and understand where we are going at and the, the debate about deeper learning and all that but I work and live in Namibia and I work in the technical vocational training so it's the exact other side than the academic side so I understand the thing of AI can help us in terms of please explain to me for a five-year-old and all that but still maybe you have another tip or another perspective on how we can take the debate on deep learning out of only the academic side, but how can it help also the technical and vocational side of education? Yeah, thank you. This is also a great question. And um, I, uh, you know, I think technical vocational training, right, is to me sort of what, you know, the development of bachelor's degrees and all that was, you know, a few decades ago. Um, this is going to be so much more important because, you know, we are lacking the skills, especially in, in emerging economies, right? You said you are in Namibia. I've seen this in Kenya where we were, you know, where I was involved in helping to understand how we build technical vocational training. Same in India, right? As a huge opportunity. Now, there are certain things where I'm telling you today um, that the theoretical knowledge can be covered by a lot of what AI does, right? In terms of the practical aspects of it, uh, in terms of the actual building of machines uh, and doing it and, you know, putting in the screws and, 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 and building systems, AI today doesn't really help you much. That's the reality, right? And that's why... This technology is coming after white-collar jobs and not after blue-collar jobs, right? I mean, this technology is more threatening, if you think in these terms, for professors than it is for, you know, a guy who has to build devices. And it's beautiful. Nobody has ever thought about it, right? We all came up with this, oh, how is it going to take off manufacturing job? No, it's not going to take off manufacturing job. It's taking out the bloody lawyers. Right. So, but I think this is a um, you know a really really important point and and also beautiful kind of scenario for um, you know what some of the limitations are, significant limitations of the technology is. Um, I think we have time for one more question, if at all. Uh, yes, and my main question would be, uh, you, you understand me? Okay, uh, yeah, so at what age would you recommend that kids are using ChatGPT to amplify learning? Because I do think that like learning how to remember, understand, etc. is still very relevant and only if you can master these skills then you can obviously go to the later stage, but you need to learn it. And if you are using AI, let's say in 
preschool already, then you might not uh, acquire the skills, yeah. right? Uh, that's a great question, and I tell you why. Um, because uh, you know, as I said, mentioned earlier, my kid is 14, and uh, so I care deeply about this. I actually, you know, sometimes you know work with kids from his school, um, and also with uh, you know just his friends and all that on this. I cannot emphasize that kids for this technology need parental supervision. If you have a child in this age, or even a little bit younger than 14, watch what he or she is doing. I have my account together with my child. I see exactly what he is doing. I help him to understand how to work with it effectively. In terms of danger curve, you know, adults are adults. They can do whatever they want to. For children, um, this is so tempting that it generates all your stuff and you don't have to do what you have to do. The only hope that we have today is that a lot of children still have an inhibition of actually using it, right? But parental supervision and teaching it early enough is incredibly important. I know it from my own personal experience. So. All right, so I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.